Good afternoon and welcome everyone watching online in Nigeria and in the United States and around the world. My name is Oge Onobogu, Africa Program Officer here at the United States Institute of Peace. USIP is a congressionally created, independent, nonpartisan institute with a mission of preventing and mitigating conflict around the world. We do this by engaging directly in conflict zones and providing resources, education and analysis to those working for peace. Before I continue, I just want to say congratulations to Nigeria. We are delighted to join you in a conversation this afternoon about Nigeria's historic elections and what comes next for Africa's biggest country. We will take your questions in just a few minutes. So please tweet, so please tweet those with the hashtag NGDecidesUSIP. Again, it's hashtag NGDecidesUSIP or post them on our USIP Facebook page. We're joined today by a stellar panel of experts, all of whom have a long history with Nigeria. Ambassador Johnny Carson is senior advisor to the president of USIP and former assistant secretary of state for African affairs. Ambassador Princeton Lyman is also senior advisor to the president of USIP and former US ambassador to Nigeria. And Dr. John Payden is a Clarence Robinson professor of international studies at George Mason University and author of one of USIP's recent publications, Religion and Conflict in Nigeria, Countdown to the 2015 Elections. Thank you all for being here today. Over the weekend, Nigeria, a country of 170 million people, gave the world a largely peaceful and credible election, probably its most transparent to date. This election represents the first time since the transition to civilian rule in 1999 that an opposition party defeated an incumbent government. This is also the first time that Nigeria used biometric card reading technology to help cut back on voter fraud and rigging. Although there were some problems, none of these dramatically altered the outcome of the vote. Ambassador Carson, you co-led an international observer delegation to Nigeria over the weekend. Could you tell us why you th think these elections went well and what are the implications for the next round of gubernatorial and state house of assembly elections on April 11th? Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here to talk about uh, Nigeria's elections uh, and to again uh, applaud the people of that country for the uh, manner in which they turned out to vote for creditable, uh, transparent, and uh, fair elections. Uh, I think that uh, the turnout, the large turnout, uh, and the success of these elections was due uh, in large measure uh, to the desire of Nigerian citizens to be able to participate uh, in a democratic process in which uh, they uh, were allowed uh, to vote for their leaders. Uh, I think uh, there is a, uh, I think there was also a very, very high degree of confidence uh, across the political spectrum and across the, the country uh, in the capacity and, and ability of the, uh, the uh, INEC, uh, the Independent National uh, Election Commission, to carry out uh, the contest. I think people uh, respected uh, Pres Professor Jaga, uh, the chair of uh, INEC, uh, and believed that uh, he would act uh, in a fair and impartial manner. Uh, in talking to uh, large numbers of uh, Nigerian uh, citizens uh, before and after the election and on election day, uh, there was a, a, a real sense uh, that the election commission uh, would in fact uh, act uh, responsibly as it did uh, and that it would uh, in fact uh, present uh, a good election to the people. Thank you very much, Ambassador Carson. Ambassador Lyman, I'd like to hear your thoughts on the elect electoral process and why you think this went well. It was a, a tremendous example of what Nigeria is capable of. I mean, this is a country that should be and often is a great nation, and sometimes it doesn't live up to that potential. Here, a lot of people came together, a lot of international attention was focused on it, and I think in, in the face of that, Nigeria pulled it off marvelously and it sends a very strong message to the rest of the continent about 
workings of democracy. The big challenges now facing uh, the president-elect, uh, Mahmoudou Buhari, largely economic and in terms of his own deep commitment to ending corruption. The economic situation is both severe but also opens up tremendous opportunities. With the drop in oil prices well below 50 or even below $50, when they had budgeted at 80, then 70, then 65, this is going to change the whole nature of the capacity of the government and all the state governments. The opportunity is to move away from that degree of dependence on oil revenue and opening up opportunities in the private sector and elsewhere, which is a very dynamic sector. Corruption is going to be hard because so much of it is deeply institutionalized. I think he's got to get at the oil sector, which is a source of a big one. He's got to get at the procurement process so he can get good infrastructural investments. He has to pick some very smart people. And I would suggest and hope that he also creates maybe an advisory committee from the many Nigerians who have been through this, who are committed, and can help him as he takes on these tasks. Thank you so much for those thoughts, Ambassador Lyman. Hopefully through the uh, discussion we'll get some, some more time to touch more on this question of the economy and corruption in Nigeria. Dr. Payden? Yes, well, let me second the remarks of my, my colleagues here and uh, to congratulate uh, General Buhari for his conciliatory tone in his acceptance speech. Uh, to uh, thank President Jonathan for his uh, graceful concession, uh, thank Professor Jaga and the INEC people and the poll observers who did a c courageous job uh, under extraordinary circumstances. Uh, I'll also thank the security people because, uh, for one reason or another, uh, they 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 rose to the rose to the challenge, and civil society organizations. But most importantly, we all thank the Nigerian people uh, and for their persistence on this. I can just say that your international friends uh, wish you well, share your pride in peaceful and credible elections, and hopefully these will continue on the April uh, 11th uh, side. Uh, let me say that uh, the other thing that struck me about the elections was the way in which the predictable problems were preempted for the most part. This didn't just happen by accident. I've served as an international observer and many times on these uh, elections. This was certainly the most challenging. The threat of violent extremism, uh, the new technologies, the, the literally millions of internally displaced people, and I tend towards the high end of my estimates on that, uh, and the managing of uh, interregional and interethnic uh, tensions. I mean, it, it could have gone in a very different uh, direction. Let me also congratulate the Christian Association of Nigeria for their graceful uh, concession and, and uh, congratulations and to the Igbo leaders from the southeast and others from the south south who have all come together now in this post-election sort of period. I mean for all of the worries that many of us had uh, this worked out extraordinarily well. I think now the real challenges uh, begin and that will be the focus of our panel today. Thank you very much. So with these challenges with the, new, with the incoming government, governance in Nigeria, surveys conducted, recent surveys in Nigeria so, show, especially those conducted by Afrobarometer, show that Nigerians value democracy. However, these same surveys show that a majority of Nigerians are not satisfied or not very satisfied with the way democracy has been working in the country. Ambassador Carson, could you share with us some thoughts about how this incoming government can refocus to start addressing the needs of Nigerians because there are high expectations of the incoming mm -hmm. uh, administration. And likewise, how can citizens manage these expectations from the new government? I think that this election contest uh, focused uh, around three issues. Uh, one was uh, change uh, and the desire of many uh, Nigerians to see uh, a change in their leadership. Uh, they wanted uh, a leader uh, and a government capable of addressing uh, their most important economic uh, problems. Uh, Large-scale uh, unemployment uh, was uh, one of those uh, issues. A failure to uh, be able to uh, generate uh, increased electrical uh, power for uh, the use by uh, citizens and by uh, corporations. Uh, the second uh, big issue uh, was uh, corruption. Uh, 
uh, and the uh, real uh, notion uh, held by many that the level of corruption uh, in Nigeria uh, had skyrocket skyrocketed over the last six years of the Jonathan administration and had reached levels uh, 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 like those that existed uh, during the uh, military regime of Sani Abacha. Uh, and thirdly, I think uh, many people uh, were uh, dissatisfied with the government's uh, efforts uh, to combat Boko Haram in the Northeast. So the desire for change and better leadership to deal with economic problems, uh, the need uh, to uh, uh, address uh, uh, corruption, uh, and the need to address security. I think uh, over the uh, next uh, uh, four years, uh, the government uh, will need uh, to uh, address all of these problems uh, in a much more systematic uh, fashion. Uh, government will uh, need to uh, revitalize uh, the uh, Economic uh, and Financial uh, Crimes Commission to go after uh, uh, corruption. They will need to uh, improve and revitalize uh, the uh, oil sector uh, eliminating uh, some of the uh, corruption that exists there and improving uh, the accountability of the, uh, uh, the, the, the petroleum uh, industry. I think there will be a need uh, to uh, improve uh, Nigeria's refining capacity. Uh, many people uh, did not notice that during uh, the week of the election, uh, the lines of cars uh, waiting uh, at petrol stations uh, to be refueled because of a shortage of uh, fuel in the country were as long as some of the, the, the lines of voters. Uh, uh, it was a testament to the uh, failure of the government to uh, be able to uh, deliver uh, petroleum there. Uh, equally, uh, the, the, the government will have to uh, be able to stimulate new uh, investment in the petroleum industry, which has been stalled for the last five years uh, because of the failure to be able to pass and introduce a new petroleum industries uh, uh, bill. Uh, and I think uh, equally, uh, there will be uh, a need to address the security problems uh, in, the, uh, in the Northeast. Uh, and this means uh, employing a refined uh, security uh, strategy uh, and also uh, aligning that strategy with a social and economic uh, strategy that uh, revitalizes uh, what has uh, been uh, a moribund uh, economy in that uh, region. So it is uh, going to be required uh, to, to have a much uh, better uh, economic and, uh, and security strategy for the North, uh, addressing issues of corruption, uh, and improving uh, economic opportunities uh, uh, and livelihoods for, for Nigeria's uh, citizens. Um, this will require uh, putting in place a, a strong team, uh, a, a qualified team, uh, but I think the potential is there. Uh, one thing that uh, Nigeria is not short of, uh, and that is uh, human capital. Uh, outstanding uh, uh, technocrats uh, and some very, very able uh, leaders who are capable of stepping into high-level jobs uh, and accomplishing a great deal. Thank you so much, Ambassador Carson. And we also thank our online audience for, for their questions. Um, we've just received a question from Aliyu Yero from Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. Um, hello to Malaysia. Uh, question is, to what extent can these elections impact the reputation and image of Nigeria in the, in the international system, still on that same theme of governance, Ambassador Lyman? Well, I think there are two aspects of it. As I mentioned before, it sends a very strong message to Africa about democracy. And Nigeria, in its return to democratic rule in 1999, began to set that direction. There's been some back and forth in Africa. This is a very important message. It says, here's the most populous country in Africa, and democracy can work. The second thing is the, to, to restore respect for the military. Nigeria's military played a big role in, in resolving West Africa uh, disputes in, in Sierra Leone and Liberia, major contribution to peacekeeping under the UN, and lately it has not functioned well uh, and needed help just to deal and contain the Boko Haram. 
I think restoring the dignity and professionalism of the military will be very important and will enhance Nigeria. It's not only its reputation, its influence. Finally, I think there is needed attention from the major countries of Africa to the AU and its strengthening in dealing with a range of problems. That only happens when the big countries lend themselves to it. Nigeria has been preoccupied with its internal problems. Now I'm hoping it can also focus on strengthening or re-strengthening the AU, which is dealing with crises in the Horn and elsewhere and needs that kind of support. Thank you very much. And our second question comes from Jonathan Sock with the Washington Times. This question came in via email. And his question is, what are the major concerns, if any, for Nigeria, Jonathan, and Buhari in the country's local elections? Still on that same, same theme on, of, of governance. Dr. Payton? Well, we're all watching to see. I think, in general, the, uh, the, the sort of the common wisdom is that there will be a bandwagon effect from the national elections. Uh, which, of course, certainly favor of the, uh, the All Progressives uh, 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 Congress. But state-level uh, dynamics are, are certainly different, and I think for all of the good news that I think we're sharing in here today, that this is uh, the April 11th elections will be, will be critical, because if those broke down or if we took our eye off the, the credible, peaceful uh, conditions here, uh, all of the international reputation, all of the goodwill and everything else could easily be uh, be squandered. There are certainly some states that are battleground states uh, and uh, uh, the logic historically is not necessarily the logic this time around. There are new coalitions that are uh, that are, are formed without going into uh, the, the details perhaps when we get into the, the panel elaborations we can we can say more about uh, the, the need for uh, need for state level peaceful and credible the the question I think will now be whether or not uh, uh, the the security people will begin to reform themselves behind what they would perceive to be the new government uh, and knowing that they will be strengthened in the in the times to come begin to step up and to make sure there's no nonsense going on and are there any thoughts or advice to Nigerians in terms of managing their expectations of this new government? This is clearly uh, the, the biggest problem for the new administration. Uh, General Buhari is a folk hero, not only in the north, but I think has become the last best hope uh, throughout the country, most of the country uh, as, as well. Expectations are extraordinarily high. You, you look at the youth in the streets and the the drumming and the dancing and the now change will come, you know, uh, we don't want to wait for a hundred days. Uh, so how they manage that, I think uh, however they put their team together and however they put their policy together, General Buhari does stand for something. There is a demonstration effect here uh, and that is no nonsense, we're going to rebuild uh, this hollowed out uh, military that has uh, shamed us, basically. If the Chadians can, and the mercenaries can do this, why can't we uh, do this? And he also stands for corruption, this anti-corruption. This was a key issue. Uh, the first question in every one of his campaign stops, are you going to put everyone in jail for 21 years? And his answer was no, this is a democratic dispensation and th there are courts. And uh, by the way, my vice president is a eight-year attorney general of, uh, of Lagos, he will know what to do on this. There's going to be no, uh, uh, no sort of knocks at, at the night. So I, I think the symbolism that Buhari and Yemi uh Bajo bring to this is a very powerful set of symbols. And I think that's why you're seeing people rally, rally around, even from the states that, that, that didn't vote for him. As Buhari said in his acceptance speech, you know, I'm the president of all Nigerians, regardless of whether you voted for me or not. Thank you very much, Dr. Payton. And on that saying, on the question of anti-corruption and the economy, no, um, Ambassador Lyman, you touched on this a little bit in the beginning during the introduction, but in the early days during the transition in Nigeria, there were some attempts at um, you know, a, a, a campaign against corruption in Nigeria. However, some of those efforts have, have stalled. Most of those efforts have stalled over the last uh, couple of years. What are your thoughts about how the incoming government can work towards reinvigorating 
that campaign against corruption in Nigeria? Well, there's two ways to get at it. One is to go after individuals, prosecute them, make an, uh, an example of them. The other is to root it out institutionally, which I think is what he has to do. Yeah, there may be some prosecutions, but the key is to try and get the oil sector to be operating uh, above board and transparently. It's still a major source of income. It's a major source of corruption. Second, if he would deliver on better power delivery, better investments in power, they're privatizing it. If he gets the investments he wants, that would be dramatic for Nigeria to have reliable power. And it would also bring in more investments. And then the area that, that Johnny referred to before, there's no reason that Nigeria should have a problem delivering fuel. Well, that also is tied up in institutional corruption. If he gets at a few key sectors and demonstrates that there's going to be changes there institutionally, I think it will begin to have a ripple effect. Mm -hmm. well, Ambassador Carson, are there any points or thoughts you'd like to add on that? I think that the uh, need for revitalization of the Economic Financial Crimes Commission should be a, a high priority. Uh, in the last four years, uh, that commission has done uh, very little uh, to prosecute individuals uh, who have been engaged uh, in high-level crime uh, in, uh, in, in Nigeria. Uh, under the uh, administration of uh, President Obasanjo, uh, and then initially under the late President Yara Adua, uh, that commission uh, brought to uh, uh, justice a number of individuals uh, who had uh, been responsible for engaged, uh, engaging in corrupt activities. Uh, the Commission has done little uh, over, the, uh, over the last several years. I think it's imperative uh, that uh, new leadership be brought to the EFCC uh, and that they go about their work uh, in a much more uh, diligent uh, fashion. Uh, I think it's uh, uh, really important uh, that uh, more attention be paid uh, to uh, the uh, crime that goes on with respect to uh, oil. Uh, and it's not just oil theft, uh, uh, simple bunkering and theft at pipelines. Uh, it's high level and sophisticated uh, uh, oil theft, uh, which occurs uh, through the letting of contracts uh, in the uh, provision of petroleum uh, in exchange for refined products brought back into the country. And Dr. Pagan? Uh, let me just say on the electric power thing, which is, which is crucial, every time that, the, that uh, Yemi Osinbajo is asked this question, he always refers to the Lagos example. They have put together at the state level really important initiatives on how do you manage power how, so that you don't have to have every person, every shop having a, their own uh, standby uh, generator. I think this will be one of their number one priorities, whether it's done through the state or the federal level or some combination. I just know that they've thought a lot about this and they, they, they know this new team knows the details of it uh, uh, without any question. On the FCC, uh, new leadership, uh, key is not to, not to politicize this. I think in the early days, it, they, they could kind of, they could kind of skirt that, uh, that, that line. Uh, but uh, if you're going to do it at all, then you have to do it without fear or favor. Uh, and it's very tempting to go after either or not go after. <laughs> it's the not go afters that we worry about, uh, how that will handle. But at the same time, you don't want witch hunts and the new team has promised no witch hunts. Mm -hmm. And in a sense, they, I don't want to say it's blanket amnesty, but they're not going to, they're going to be looking forward, not looking backwards. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to worry about uh, all of the the marginal characters, you know, fleeing the country at this stage. I mean, you're going to need every, every hand on deck, but this is, there's a new sheriff in town. <laughs> Thank you so much. So we have a question from Legal Bite uh, from Nigeria, and his question or, is, um, there are some grievances that have been aired by the Nigerian military in regards to corruption, mi by military personnel in regards to corruption. Um, how, what, what are your thoughts on how this incoming uh, government can help in addressing, can work towards addressing these grievances? Ambassador Carson, let's start Well, I think that, question. yeah, let me just say that uh, 
uh, the top level uh, of the uh, of the the military has been uh, substantially weakened over the last uh, ten years by the removal of uh, senior commanders initially uh, by uh, President Obasanjo uh, and then under the Yaradawa administration and this has continued uh, under uh, the administration of, of good luck uh, uh, Jonathan. Uh, it is absolutely critical uh, that the uh, strong professionalism that uh, existed in Nigeria's uh, military, military be uh, restored. Uh, that officers be uh, promoted uh, and advanced on the basis of uh, their uh, qualifications, uh, their competence, uh, and their experience, uh, and not on the basis of uh, their political loyalty uh, or uh, the region from which they, they, they come. Uh, it's also important uh, that uh, military contracts or contracts that are made for uh, the provision of military uh, equipment uh, be far more uh, transparent uh, and open than they have been uh, in, the, uh, in the past. Uh, clearly, uh, there have been uh, concerns uh, about uh, how uh, contracting has been uh, let and to whom it has been uh, let. Uh, but the Nigerian military uh, has a uh, strong historical uh, record, as Ambassador Lyman pointed out, uh, in helping to restore peace and uh, stability and democracy to Liberia and Sierra Leone. Uh, and they have also been uh, and continue to be uh, one of the top ten uh, countries providing UN peacekeeping uh, uh, forces around the world. Uh, they can again be uh, a strong uh, force uh, with, uh, with superior uh, uh, talent at the, at, at the top. Uh, and I think uh, making sure that the military isn't politicized uh, is, uh, is, is a key part of that. Making sure that the uh, transactions that they uh, engage in uh, uh, to buy equipment is done uh, in a transparent and open manner. Mm -hmm. okay. Ambassador Lyman, Dr. Payton. Uh, let me just say, I, I think this uh, re-upping the Nigerian military is the number one priority of, uh, of uh, President-elect uh, Buhari. I think it's a matter of both personal and professional pride there. Others can handle the economics side of, of things, the Lagos people in, in particular. But this, uh, where you have a fifth of the budget going to the military and very little to show for it in the, in the Northeast, uh, is is a cloud that is hanging over uh, the entire uh, military there and the, indeed the, the state. Uh, the Nigerian military is going to have to, and this is where Buhari comes in, going to have to retool itself so that it can deal with domestic as well as external kinds of threats. It wasn't trained to do the, in the domestic side of things. That has turned out to be its, its uh, Achilles uh, heel. The intake process is by states for officers, as you know, and then it's supposed to be by merits. But in recent years, uh, political loyalties have also crept in. And indeed, for the domestic purposes, sometimes the rotational process for officers has meant that you get people up in the northeast who, who simply don't know the language and the culture, and that has exacerbated the uh, problem. So all of this, this full scale review and reform will be, uh, will be a top priority and it will be a, an immediate priority. This will be a, a first hundred days uh, kind of issue and it's not just merit but it's the balancing off of all of the complexities of Nigerian life. It's one thing to send peacekeepers abroad, it's one thing to kind of crack down if you're doing uh, you know, procurement and that sort of thing but how you deploy your, your officers and then not lose the, the loyalty of the, of the enlisted men is, is a key problem. And that takes leadership, and that's where Buhari, I think, we're, we're hopeful on. Just to add one thing on, on uh, this, I agree fully with what John just said. The one good thing I think comes out of this election is that the Boko Haram problem is no longer going to be politicized. That held up the ability of the country to focus and organize and deal with it 
Yeah, it was a, a, a political football almost between the North and the South, who was at fault, who was supporting it, etc. I think now that that will be largely set aside. And that gives the new administration an opportunity not only to focus on it in a constructive way, but as Johnny said, it to look at it not just as a military problem, but as a broad social and economic one, and to enlist the governors on that behalf. And that will also go uh, to what they do on the economy and how they redress some of the imbalances between North and South in the economy. It'll be more difficult, but I'll just mention one of the opportunity here. And that is for a better relationship with the United States. We have had ups and downs with Good Luck Jonathan. This is an opportunity to establish a really strong relationship with an incoming administration. Opening up, we have Power Africa, the initiative from the US, you have Feed the Nation, you have all kinds of opportunities of cooperation that will fit with the priorities of the new administration. Thank you very much. And so now on to the topic of national security and religion in Nigeria. National security still remains a, a very hot topic in the country. And in the lead up to the elections, there were several events that happened in the country that completely undermined citizens' uh, confidence in the ability of the government to protect uh, the people. Uh, so although the outgoing government has made some inroads in dislodging Boko Haram from, from some of its uh, strongholds, Boko Haram has not been defeated yet. So Dr. Payden, this question is for you. Um, what, what are your thoughts on how this incoming government can work towards um, strategically handling the Boko Haram insurgency and also tackling uh, Nigeria's sort of recurring circle of violent extremism? Well, I think the, the answer to Boko Haram is going to come from within Nigeria. Uh, and that, as much as anything, is the soft power rather than the hard power issue of getting your relations uh, on, a, on a constructive level between Muslims and Christians and within the Christian community and within the Muslim community. Uh, that's your counter narrative there. Uh, and just simply more attack helicopters. Uh, particularly by people who don't know what they're doing in terms of who's on the ground. You know, there's a village, let's get them. You know, that just exacerbates uh, the situation. Uh, there are probably various things that could be said about how you do this preliminary precondition to having an effect, uh, effective uh, counter approach to uh, that. And, and uh, one of them that I'll just call attention to, we can go into more detail, uh, is the, the efforts by the interfaith uh, Initiative for Peace, uh, Cardinal Onayakon, Sultan Saad Abu Bakr, have done any number of things to reach out and try to get Muslims and Christians. This is not a northern Muslim problem. This is a national, this is an all of government, all of country problem, all of region problem for that, for that matter as, as, uh, as well. And so you can't ig ignore the underlying plate tectonics. You've got to have them working for you rather than against you. I think they're I think this election has validated the efforts, and, and it's one of the things I've watched very closely uh, in the last so many months, is can they get that part right? Because other, otherwise, the elections fall, Boko Haram wins, and we're all back to, uh, back to where, where we are. Uh, there is no, I, I sometimes think of, if I may say, uh, Boko Haram in different stages, and the drivers were different at different points in, in, in time. Where stage one was the quietest stage, stage two, the, the killing of the leader of the jail, the jailbreak, and then the stage three, after the uh, 11 elections, the dissolution of Libya, the new, etc., the Ansaru groups and stuff coming in, and then the hit and run, and then last summer, the switch over to, to take and hold territory. These are very different phases, different drivers, uh, for them uh, as well. So there's no, there's no uh, silver uh, bullet on this. But I, I do think that um, the counter narrative is something that it takes political leadership and example, and I think that's potentially in place here, here, here now for this. Beyond that, uh, education and jobs, I mean, how, how often do we have to say it? Uh, the North has been going down in their, in their indicators of development, uh, while other parts of the country have been going up, partly because investment likes peace and security. No one's going to invest if you've got big security 
uh, issues uh, to deal with. So you, in a sense, the Sultan has always said, no peace, no development. And I think that mantra, now if we can kind of see that both peace is a, is a precondition to the development, but also it's a way of undermining the claims of the Boko Haram people that, uh, you know, these are dead-end kids who don't have any other way of, of doing it. It's not the, it's not the only, it's not the only thing. Uh, but the counter-narrative, the education and the jobs, and then I go back to reforming the police and the military. I don't think you can have effective policing unless you have, I'll just say it, state and local police. <laughs> 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 they, they, they borrowed a lot from the American Constitution in terms of federalism. They missed that one, and I understand the full background of why they missed it, that all police are federal. You cannot deal with local problems, at least as it started out at stage one. I, uh, using my cancer metaphor, metaphor again, we're now at stage four where it's metastasized. Then it, it's, it's a different problem than if it had been nipped uh, at those uh, earlier, uh, early, earlier stages. But the combination of attacking corruption, which is not just, the, you don't, not just economic development, is, is also part of this demonstration effect where you you have to tell kids that it isn't just this, the 1% is skimming off everything and then the 99%, you know, too bad. They've got to address this in, a, in, a, in an oil state uh, because it's awfully easy to think, well, that's someone else's uh, problem. And it, it, there, if it were done all in the uh, up and up, maybe that's one thing. But if it's, if it's done through nepotism or if it's done through sweetheart deals and so forth or just simply bunkering and taking the money uh, to uh, is it has got to, you've got to deal with corruption to deal with Boko Haram there and at the same time begin what my friend Johnny Carson would call a Marshall Plan for Northern Nigeria <laughs> uh, you've got to just simply realize that uh, even in even though Boko Haram is not quite you know on the ropes yet you've got to choke off the oxygen uh, from it, you've got to make sure the military isn't creating more recruits there by by uh, heavy-handedness, uh, and, uh, uh, and 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 that that those, so anti-corruption, the reform of the military, the uh, the major efforts uh, to revitalize the North, and I know the World Bank is working on this. I know the EU is interested, and in the British and the American, everyone wants to help out on this and so how that can be marshaled and organized and prioritized it's not just business as usual it's business with a lot of these things still up in the air and let me just say that although uh, Abuja sometimes tends to and the international press tends to think this is a northeast problem it has spread from those three state of emergencies down into Bauchi and to Gombe and into the middle belt and into and you also need to be reminded that Kano, after my degree, has been the second largest target of, uh, of violent extremists. Uh, and, and so and this is a problem across the north. And it's not, if it had not been stamped, you would find it down in Lagos. All it would take would be a few big, and then all of a sudden, direct foreign investment would, would uh, dry up on there. So it's definitely a national problem. It's something that, as I say, no silver bullet, but uh, we're at a stage four situation here now where the military is going to be uh, uh, critical, but then you need that follow-up with development, with the anti-corruption, all of the things that we know need to be put in place, and the international community, and indeed I, I think Abuja is, is, in general is, lives in silos, lives in compartments, uh, and that's someone else, education is someone else's building business. I have a personal view that I, unless you deal with uh, getting vocational training and peace studies into uh, the Quranic schools. You just have another 10, 12 million kids who, who are going to not have jobs at the other end. So somehow, and I know U.S. Institute of Peace is, has been working on this uh, project as well. So uh, uh, everything needs to be done at once. And uh, it's not going to get done in the first hundred days, but you've got to have leadership and political will to get the direction. And then I think things will fall into place. Yeah. Just a, uh, a couple of quick comments. I agree with everything that John has, uh, has said. It, it, it clearly is a, uh, a complex and multi-dimensional problem, uh, and it needs uh, a multi-dimensional solution. Uh, it is you know, absolutely key uh, that uh, peace and stability uh, be restored. 
uh, but uh, resolving uh, the problem of Boko Haram uh, will require more than just a military solution. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that is absolutely uh, critical. Uh, at the heart of what's uh, happened uh, up there uh, is a sense of uh, economic, uh, social, and political marginalization. Uh, people feeling as though they have been uh, let down uh, and kept out uh, of uh, the uh, of the uh, country's economy and opportunity for uh, development. Uh, one of the key problems that will have to be addressed uh, overall is to find a way at the national level uh, for uh, Nigeria to ex substantially expand out uh, its economy from s essentially being an oil-dependent economy. Uh, and this uh, will uh, require uh, opening up uh, the uh, economy uh, to more uh, opportunities, investment, and development that go beyond uh, the nation's dependence on, 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 on oil. Uh, you know, still today, you know, Nigeria gets 90, 95 percent of uh, its foreign exchange earnings from, from oil. It gets, uh, uh, you know, 80, uh, 80 percent of uh, the of its uh, government revenues come from, uh, from, from oil. Uh, the country has to find uh, a way to be able uh, to uh, generate uh, more uh, domestic and foreign investment, create more economic opportunities uh, for uh, Nigeria's uh, burgeoning population, uh, and especially that population which uh, lives uh, in, the, in, in the north. Uh, you can end the military crisis uh, in the Northeast, uh, but unless you find a way uh, to uh, end uh, the 40 to 50 to 60 percent uh, unemployment and underemployment there, uh, you're only going to sow the seeds for more uh, uh, conflict in the future. Uh, jobs have to be found, uh, industries have to be uh, developed, and opportunities have to be made for, for people in the Northeast, but also for other parts of the country as, uh, as well. Uh, oil can be a catalyst for other things, uh, but the government has to find a way uh, to expand uh, economic opportunity for all Nigerians, but particularly those uh, in the Northeast who have been impacted so much by instability uh, and an a, an absence of economic opportunity. Um, Ambassador Lyman? Yeah, I want to speak to one other area of the country that's going to be challenging but difficult, and that's the Delta area where the oil is produced, an area that was uh, very unstable some years ago, a lot of violence, a lot of sealing of oil called bunkering. Uh, a, a certain degree of peace was brought around by an amnesty, which in fact paid very substantial sums to leaders of those communities who are now big contractors, et cetera. But bunkering still goes on, and there's no question that it involves a lot of collusion, maybe even with the Navy and other things. So to get at that kind of a problem, and this is a good luck Jonathan area, mm -hmm. and not create more backlash and more violence as one attacks that, it's not going to be easy. I think it's probably, the administration probably continue the amnesty and the payments for now, and then look at ways to get outside the corruption, and then, and after these elections take place, to, to get at the corruption problem at the state and local government problem because area, because there's been a lot of money that's gone into Delta, and you don't see the results. So helping people access those resources will make a difference, but it's not going to be easy. There's a lot of dynamite in this that, you, that the administration is going to have to proceed very, very carefully. I just want to say we've, we've gotten a lot of questions from, from our online audience and thank you so much. If I can just go through um, two or three of these questions, we have about 15 minutes, but I just want to mention that we will stay on for about 20 minutes and respond to any other questions that come in online. So we have a question from, and this is related to the national security uh, point from Dr. Duraji Moses from Covenant University in Nigeria. And he says, given the voting patterns in the elections, it's obvious that Nigeria is divided along ethnic and religious lines. How can the new government unite the country? Dr. Payden. 
Well, let me go back to um, let me go back to the mechanisms that were put in place after the Civil War. I've lived through the Civil War. I've lived through the run-up to the Civil War. I'm keenly aware of how they tried to create mechanisms so that never again. The federal character, which we now take for granted, means that every state is represented in the cabinet. Uh, so all 36 have to, be, have to be there. It was equal access is the principle. The balance north-south in terms of the national tickets, the power shift, power share, uh, sometimes uh, didn't happen in, in, in recent, uh, recent uh, times. Uh, so there are mechanisms, uh, and I think the, a generation of uh, Buhari's peers who, who fought and died to keep Nigeria together are keenly aware of that. I think sometimes the younger generations, the technocrats, you know, didn't get that in their, in their briefing, uh, briefing books. I think there are lots of ways, and I would imagine the first thing that Buhari will do is create a team that is, that is nationally balanced. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, uh, and that will be, uh, and maybe even bend over backwards to uh, include people that you wouldn't, uh, you wouldn't uh, uh, expect. So Nigeria, I think, has an opportunity to, to live up to its, its, own, the, its own sense of what its potential is in terms of the diversity there. I mean, it's the largest country in the world by far uh, that's half Muslim, half Christian. Uh, how you make that work for you rather than against you uh, will be a challenge. I think there's a generational learning experience that needs to be uh, rearticulated and uh, by example here uh, as, uh, as well. The no victor, no vanquished uh, motto of the, to keep Nigeria one is a task which must be done. I mean, we've all lived, some of us have lived through that period. It sounds kind of corny now, but it works. It works and the message has to be sent time and time again. Uh, that we are one country, this is our, and our contribution in many ways to the world uh, is that we can live with each other with this kind of uh, extreme uh, diversity. At the state level, there are problems, uh, as, as we all know, in the plateau and in some of the middle belt uh, states. Uh, and are there, there are certainly those both in the southeast uh, who would like to break away, and there are some in the south-south that would like to break away. I think through combinations of carrots and sticks uh, and just good common sense inclusion uh, is the way in which this thing will, will move forward. And I, again, that's one of the takeaways I take from this election. We now have a national coalition as an op opposition party. I mean, we don't, you can't take that for granted. That hasn't happened before in the Fourth Republic and it didn't, hasn't happened in some of the previous republics uh, as, as, as well. So how to keep uh, if, uh, the idea of democracy usually involves uh, accountability and transparency and an opposition that's, that's, uh, that's viable. And, uh, and so we now have that. So I would hope that the opposition party will regroup, uh, the new opposition party, and uh, they will both stay national and not retrench to their regional bases. Uh, just quickly, you know, some of the tension that is attributed to religious tension is really very often uh, uh, political and resource driven. And you see this in Plateau State, where it just happens that the Christian population is largely farmers, the Muslim population are cattle people, there's a struggle over land, access to land resources, but political people mobilize people around these issues, make them religious, encourage violence. Mm -hmm. And I think that part of it is leaders who do not do that yeah. and attack the real roots of these problems in these areas where they come up against each other. And that's going to be very important. It's not just religious in the, in the broad sense. It's how these things get played and used in, for political purposes. You know, just a, a quick note. I think there are far more institutions uh, and uh, far more uh, uh, elements uh, pulling Nigeria together today uh, than they are pulling Nigeria uh, apart. And clearly there were uh, indications in this election uh, that uh, the South-South uh, voted strongly against uh, Buhari uh, as a candidate. Uh, but if you look at this uh, election, 
uh, you saw uh, a balanced ticket on both sides. And you saw, and I think the reason, one of the reasons why Buhari won is that uh, he not only campaigned uh, in the north uh, uh, where he is from, but he made a concerted effort uh, to reach out uh, to those states uh, in the southeast and also in the south southwest. Uh, his campaign uh, was a nationwide campaign, uh, and uh, he spoke to the concerns of, of all Nigerians uh, for change, uh, for uh, an end to corruption, and a need to address the country's uh, security uh, problems. And that change message was a message that focused on expanding economic opportunity, addressing the issues of uh, power and electrification, access to, to, to oil, uh, the need for jobs, better schools and, and infrastructure, which are, which are national issues. And the fact that he was able to win uh, substantially uh, in the Southwest, I think is a testament to his uh, efforts to reach out to the, uh, to the nation as a whole. But equally, there are other drivers that pull Nigeria together. And one of the, the, the groups that we haven't really talked about as a whole is civil society. Uh, and the large array of civil society groups uh, in uh, Nigeria uh, that cross both regional lines, cross ethnic lines, uh, cross religious lines, and cross uh, community uh, lines. Uh, and uh, we see this uh, in groups like the Transitional Monitoring Group, which did such an effective job of uh, their quick count and their parallel vote uh, tabulation process, which reaffirmed uh, very clearly uh, that uh, the INEC was right uh, in making the, the, the call. Uh, the uh, commitment of the uh, national, Nigeria's National uh, Youth Service Corps uh, young men and women, recent college graduates uh, from all over the nation uh, going out and running the uh, elections uh, across, uh, across Nigeria. Uh, th things like this pull the country uh, together. And even though we're critical, uh, as we should be, of some of the recent uh, past performances of the, uh, of the uh, Nigerian uh, military, uh, it is a national military. Uh, it's not a regional military. Uh, and no longer do we uh, have a, a Nigerian military where the officer corps comes from one part of the country uh, and the enlisted, uh, all the enlisted men and women come from another part of the country. The institutions pull uh, the country together. And it's important, I think, as Professor Payton has uh, said, is to, for leaders to continue to uh, focus on uh, those uh, strengthening those institutions that pull the nation together uh, rather than uh, uh, pointing out uh, the differences uh, that exist uh, out there. Okay, so we have two questions. We have a bunch of questions over here, but again, thank you so much for these wonderful questions. We will stay over to respond to them, but we have two questions that will be um, really good for us to close with, and they come from in here, in USIP. So we have one question from Susan Stigant, who, <laughs> who is a director of Africa Programs, and another question from Peter Lodge over here at USIP. And I think just to sum it up, in, in summary, what should, be, um, what should be the role of US policymakers and what should US policymakers be telling the incoming government and the Nigerian people now? Ambassador Lyman, should we start with you? Well, as I said earlier, I think there's an opportunity now to, to, uh, to establish a, a very powerful, productive relationship with this administration to talk about anti-corruption, getting at the security problems, et cetera. But you can't overwhelm them. This is a Nigerian challenge. And, uh, and what we can do, I think there are several areas in which U.S. can be extremely helpful. I think channeling uh, private investment through programs like Power Africa to get at this very critical power sector, helping in other areas, uh, expanding programs that are uh, underway about youth and, 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 and building youth capacity. We have this 
programs now, we, the young uh, African leadership programs. But I think politically, reinforcing the efforts of the government to do what it set out to do. And that means providing whatever uh, uh, technical advice, whether it's political advice, uh, security advice, but Nigerians will be in the lead on all of this. This is not, this is not a, a incapable country. But I do think the opportunities will open up because I think the political relationship, if we take advantage of it, can be much better than it's been and therefore open up these opportunities. Thank you so much. Ambassador Carson? Um, I think that uh, the United States should do as much uh, as it possibly can to uh, build a strong partnership uh, with Africa's most important nation, its most significant uh, economic nation, and with its largest uh, democracy. Uh, our uh, relationship should be uh, established on a, on a strong partnership, a shared interest, and shared values. Uh, I think that uh, one of the early uh, things that uh, we should do is to uh, find an opportunity uh, for the administration uh, to invite uh, President-elect uh, Buhari to uh, Washington. Uh, to uh, reassure him uh, of our friendship uh, and partnership. Uh, look for ways to uh, revitalize uh, and strengthen uh, the strategic dialogue uh, that we have with Nigeria that was established uh, under Secretary of State uh, Clinton. A and to uh, put uh, some stronger uh, uh, meat and muscle on the bone of this uh, relationship. Uh, in areas uh, like uh, power uh, and uh, electrification, uh, in strengthening of the effort to encourage uh, a greater American uh, investment uh, in uh, Nigeria, investment uh, which creates manufacturing uh, capacity, uh, investment uh, which uh, in uh, creates uh, jobs for, uh, for uh, Nigerians, investment which creates stronger trade links beyond oil between Nigeria uh, and, uh, and the United States. I think uh, equally uh, uh, we should uh, uh, engage uh, with uh, Nigeria's uh, new ministers uh, as they come on board uh, in, uh, a, uh, in, in seeking out early opportunities uh, to work together. Uh, in the agricultural realm, in the manufacturing realm, in the transportation realm. Uh, we need to do these things uh, quickly and we need to do them uh, uh, early in the uh, administration uh, to uh, demonstrate the desire for this partnership. And finally, we need to uh, look at a way uh, to help strengthen uh, the security relationship uh, between our military uh, and the uh, Nigerian uh, military uh, to help find ways uh, to restore uh, its, uh, uh, its capacity to perform at, at levels uh, which it performed at in the, uh, in the past. All of these things uh, are uh, essential. I think our, some of my panelists have noted that I think that over the, the last two years, the last two and a half years, uh, the relationship between uh, Washington uh, and Abuja had started to drift uh, apart. Uh, and it had started to drift apart in large measure because of a uh, mutual lack of, of, uh, of, of understanding about how to deal with the issue of, of Boko Haram. Uh, with a new administration in Abuja, and a new willingness on the part of Washington to, to work with that administration. I think there are many opportunities uh, for uh, this country uh, to reach out to Nigeria and for Nigeria to reach out uh, to the United States. I don't think there is a large country in Africa uh, that uh, has a better appreciation uh, of uh, the United States and what it stands for uh, than Nigeria. And I think that uh, Nigeria is fundamentally 
uh, committed to the same kinds of democratic values and principles as the United States, and therefore should, in fact, be a strong partner uh, to, uh, to, to, to us in Washington. Thank you so much for that, Ambassador Carson. Just a quick point. As the question, I think, was, was framed, it's what should U.S. policy makers be telling the Nigerian government? I would change that. We should be listening uh, to, the, to the new team. We, uh, Northern Nigerians are more comfortable in London than they are in, than they are in Washington for historical uh, reasons. Uh, we're used to, the international community gets used to the idea that incumbents always win. Uh, and now we have a real democracy. <laughs> what do we do with it? We get acquainted and we listen. That's it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. This was a very, very interesting discussion. We look forward to continuing this discussion. And I just want to close this with a, a tweet from Abdul Kadir Wakili from Abuja, who says, Jaga, uh, Dr. Jaga has definitely done a credible job for Nigeria. All Nigerians should be proud. Nigeria has shown the world that democracy is here to stay. So thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you.